Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So here we are in Alabama. You've all been here a few days. Uh, I just got here last night. And, and I'm again shocked, 8 o'clock in the morning, and all of you had all these options, and here you are. Now, I know it was the breakfast that probably pulled you in. Because, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, but anyway, thank you for coming. And let's, let's acknowledge the folks here in, at the University of Alabama for the great work having, having so much work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Special thanks go to uh, Dr. Pruitt, uh, Dr. Heather Pleasance, and Dr. Ed Mullins uh, for organizing us and working with us over the several, past several months and working together. What I would uh, like to do before I get going too, too, far, uh, too far is just, I don't know how many, let me just ask, a show of hands, how many of you have ever had to give a plenary talk in front of this many or more people before? Yeah, look at that, a lot of it. This is hard work. It's basically an impossible task because uh, you have people here that are students, you have people here that are community partners, you have deeply engaged scholars, many of you whom I know, you have people who are brand new to the work. It's basically an impossible task. So, and additionally to that, I'm now working with a new colleague uh, halfway across the country, and, and, and we're up to the challenge, and we hope you are too. So we just hope you'll come along with us on a journey today. At the end, we promise that we're going to provide some time for some interaction among your tables and also with us, and we're going to circulate, and we'll have a little bit of a full group conversation. It depends on, uh, on, uh, on how we do here. So that's our hope. Um, I want to ask here, could you give me a show of hands if you are currently associated with the University of Alabama? Okay, excellent. So a good, a good bit of you. So something funny happened last night when we were coming in from the airport. Um, the shuttle driver, he was very kind, he kept very quiet. Kevin and I were just getting to know each other. And, um, <clears throat> and finally I, I, I leaned forward and I touched him on his shoulder. And I said, excuse me, sir, how are you doing? He's driving down the highway, right? He says, I'm doing fine. Is there something I can help you with? I said, yes, we're going to the University of Alabama, right? He said, yes, sir, we are. I said, now, you all have a football team, right? <laughs> now, that poor man almost swerved off the road. And I said to him, now, you all doing pretty well this year, right? And he said, yes, sir, we're number one. We're ranked number one in the country. I said, well, congratulations to you. I said, sir, do you know who's ranked number two in the country? And he said, oh, well, why would I know that? And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, it's the Ducks, the Oregon Ducks. I said, that's right. So I said, sir, I'm from Oregon. And he looked at me, he looked at me, and I, I thought he was going to stop that van. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, I know we have some friends here from Oregon State. I don't think we have anybody here from the University of Oregon. But we're from the, I'm from the other university in Oregon, right there in the city from Portland State University. So I want to acknowledge and congratulate the folks here from Alabama for having such a good football team. Um, and we all know that the only thing that's more important than football on a college campus is community engagement. And that's why we're here, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, so before I give it to Kevin, this is for us. If you could help us, just give us a sense of who's in the room. Also, if you haven't done this, in this conference you probably have. It's also good to remind. So let's just start with a simple one. Would you raise your hand for us, for me please, really nice and high, if you are a student. Any students? Oh, let's look, at, look at all the students in this. That's great. That's great. I want to just give a special hand to the students. Okay, and if you're a faculty member, however you define that, please raise your hand. And you can raise your hand twice. Look at that. Nice amount of faculty. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. How about any administrators in the room? OK, all right, excellent. People pull, pulling the levers of change here. And finally, any community partners in the room? Any community partners? Great, extra hand for the community partners. All right, so as Heather said, I'm Kevin Keskis, and I'm at Portland State, and I'm really happy to be here with you this morning. And I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Foster. How is he reading that? I'm going to read it next, next one. All right, so uh, to start out, just to give you a sense of where we're gonna go this morning, um, here's a little bit uh, of a roadmap. We're hoping to have uh, some good conversation that takes us from the sort of conceptual or theoretical 
where, as, as many of us know, if we're reading uh, JSIS, if we're you know, engaged in this work for some period of time, there's a number of different ways to think about community engagement. For the purposes of our talk, there's a number of different ways to think about and talk about institutional change. So we're sort of privileging the conceptions and the ideas that we've worked on over the years, but also fully acknowledging that there's a lot of ways to look at change and look at engagement. So we'll, we'll start out with some models of community engagement. We'll present an idea of a, of a continuum of change that we hope will be useful when you think about working in the context of institutions, working in the context of complex structures, how you begin to be specific and purposeful about sort of moving the needle in terms of creating space for community engagement on your campus or in your uh, social network. We'll move to some examples, and then we want to spend some time on sort of table talk, where you all get a chance to talk with one another about some of the ideas, and then some, hopefully some open conversation. Um, Dr. Keshes is, my, is a senior colleague, so he wins this one. But if it were my class, or if I were preaching in church, there'd be no back row Joes, right? I would tell everybody in the back to move to the front and make it more intimate, but Kevin reminded me that folks are eating, folks are waking up, and that folks are gonna be coming and going. So even as we've kind of created a space that is, I think, gonna facilitate some really good conversation, I'll ask or request of us that we also kind of be vigilant about the sacredness of any community or any space that we set up, and that even as you might be in the far back and even as it becomes you know, enticing, if things get good sometimes, you also, do you ever want to turn to a neighbor? And you know, I, I really agree with that. Or man, Kev sucks. He, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> and, and I don't get to say which Kev we're talking about, right? So one of us isn't any good or whatever. You want to turn to a neighbor and say that. So it, it, this is a space that will probably work very well for us, but I'll also ask us to sort of guard the sacredness of this space in terms of our engagement over the uh, course of the next hour or so. And what we'll hope to do in return is to try to turn this over to you all at some point so that there really is a robust opportunity for you all to talk with one another and then to bring it back to an open conversation. And we'll see if that, how that works for us. All right, so I'm back to Kevin. Okay, so this, will be, this is the Kevin and Kevin show in case you haven't figured it out yet. And we've never done this, so at the end you can let us know how it went. But I wanna start off here when we talk about the models of community engagement to remind us I was just doing some reading again yesterday on the plane, and I just stopped on the plane, I closed my book, sat back for a second, and I, I was again shocked by the magnitude, the magnitude of the opportunity that we have here in front of us as members of post-secondary institutions, magnitude. There are over 4,200 degree granting institutions in this country alone. In the aggregate, we employ more than three million people. There are over 18 million students that attend our colleges and universities. And in 2006, in the aggregate, post-secondary institutions spent over $373 billion in goods and services. We are an important engine in our communities we have been here a long time, and unlike companies that go offshore and move all over the place, we're not going anywhere. Last time I looked, these buildings are pretty solid. It's an unbelievable responsibility in front of us. So we are faced with this magnitude of opportunity. There's another thing that we're faced with, magnitude of inertia, because our institutions are traditional, and the role of tradition is to kind of hold the line to let change happen slowly, and there's a really good role for that. So to help us remember that, I want to read something from Clark Kerr, famous president, University of California, Berkeley, 40 years ago said, a real maverick himself in 1963, the universities become more of a bureaucracy than a community, a mechanism held together by administrative rules and powered by money a series of individual faculty entrepreneurs held together by a common grievance over parking. <laughs> now you can go to the University of Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley, and you can see there's a Clark Kirk campus, and he's a famous man. This is his kind of his, uh, 
his summary reflections on a great uh, life in higher education. So the first thing that we want to talk about is one of the models of engagement that we, that we can acknowledge, as we've written here, is public relations. Public relations are important. I'm assuming everybody in this room knows what that is and why they're important. And um, I support that for 10 years uh, working in the provost's office at Portland State University. Part of what I did was tell our story. And it's, it's very important. And I'll just leave it at this, and that I think we all acknowledge that that's where maybe we can start the day, but that's certainly not where we need to end the day. And so a next model of community engagement that is practiced increasingly is that which we can call neoliberal. And when we talk neoliberal, we're not talking liberal versus conservative in the contemporary sense. We're talking neoliberal as, as a revitalization of a, of a 19th century liberalism that's now turned to the 21st century. And what we have in many universities is increasing an increasing bent towards efficiency, effectiveness, partnership in some ways that are potentially dynamic, but also can be um, uh, all right, soul sucking. And what I mean by that is that we can do amazing things when we partner where we say, well, you know, we don't have enough money to build this lab. But we can go down the street and partner with someone IBM or whoever, and we can create some new after school programs, or we can create a facility for joint use, or we, there's things that we can do that are efficient and effective and are anything but soul sucking. They're, they're exciting and dynamic. But at some point, our danger or our risk with the neoliberal model is that all we care about is efficiency. And that we're not as directly and strategically purposeful in terms of our original vision for why we reach out to folks and why we enter into community with folks. We end up tending towards, well, this is a really great thing to do and we can do it. And no one asked really why or whether that's a good thing, but it's economically prudent, so we do it. So one model of community engagement that has some promise, but also some peril attached is the neoliberal. And finally, before we talk about a, a, a third type of model, third and final type of model about facilitating positive change. I want to remind us that um, today is an important day. Something important is going to happen tonight. And that is uh, our two presidential candidates are going to debate tonight. I'm assuming many of you will watch it. I certainly am going to try to watch as much of that as I can around uh, the other commitments I have for tonight. And it reminds me again that, and I'll say it, this work is small p political. Change is political work. And so there are two ways to work that. We can deny that and run away from that, or we can run into it and embrace it. And I, take, I do the, follow, the, the latter. I lean into it and embrace it. It is absolutely small p political work. And to that end, I'm going to tell a little teeny story. I'm going to tell a story about my friend Dick Harmon. Dick Harmon is a senior man. He is uh, a very, very accomplished man. He's worked all over the United States and Canada with the Industrial Areas Foundation, which is a community organizing group. Started first by Saul Alinsky in Chicago many years ago. Dick Harmon is now uh, probably in his mid-70s. And he and I became friends about, uh, good close friends about 10 years ago. And we talked about how community organizing could work in post-secondary education. And so one of the things that I did in my role as Associate Vice Provost for Engagement is we held these things called Civic Engagement Breakfasts. And I'd get somewhere between two and 300 people from Portland State and Portland to come to these breakfasts a couple times, a couple, three times a year. And I said, Dick, would you come and be uh, one of our two or three main people? And I'll be, you'll be the first, really, person, because you're from, I always try to have somebody from the community to come and talk with us. And he said, Kevin, I'm reluctant. Anyway, I talked Dick into coming. And he said, OK, I'll come. So, the room was pretty full. There, was all, there were over 300 people in the room, several deans. I think our provost was in the room. I introduced Dick. I was very happy. That's all I do. I kind of organize it and then get out of the way. And Dick got up. I thought he was going to talk about community organizing and the, kind of the three rules that they have and things like this. He got up, and he, he went in front, and he said, he stood in front of everybody, and he said, he looked at me, he said, Kevin, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I'm going to say something right now that's going to upset you. And I hope I don't, actually I hope I upset some of you too in this room. 
He said, higher education, higher education, does that mean that there's a lower education? And he went on to say and challenge everybody in that room. He said, who do you really think you are? Who do you really think you are? He said, I'm a community partner, and I've been invited to come into your university here in these hallowed walls, and I'm intimidated, because this is higher education, and I'm intimidated. And I'm a man in my mid-70s, and I've had a long and rich and successful career, several books, several change, changes, major changes that he's led. And he said, yet, I'm intimidated in these walls. And he said, this work, the way that we've set up this whole dynamic, community partners, and we come here, and we're, we're supposed to kind of ask you for your resources, he says, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. And then Dick went on to talk about a different kind of way that's less wrong, about acknowledging each other's wisdom and knowledge in the room, about finding a new way, about understanding when we're doing research, we're doing teaching, that there's multiple sources of wisdom and knowledge everywhere. And you know, I sat there thinking, oh no. But by the end of that hour and a half breakfast, I'll tell you, people loved Dick. They stood up and gave him a standing ovation. People wanted him to come talk to their classes and engage and partner with him. He said, no, no, I'm on my way out. So anyway, I wanted to tell that story because that hit me. That was five or six years ago uh, in a very, very profound way when I'm working with community partners and when all of us are working with community partners. And in fact, if we're trying to facilitate positive change, a couple things. It's political work. And whether we acknowledge it, understand it, or like it or not, we're coming from a position of unbelievable power simply because we're associated with the university. And there's a way to break, there are many, many ways to break through those walls, but we have to break through those walls. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about some of that right now. So one way, or one aspect of the work, is the reality of change. The reality that where many of us hope for our institutions to be is not where they are today and certainly not where they were yesterday. And so we say, well, how do we push forward? And for many of us, it's a, it's a rough journey. If you come from a sort of radical edge, if you come as a person whose background marks you as a sort of historically marginalized population, if you're among the many folks who enter the academy, not just with the privilege of knowledge for knowledge's sake, which is a beautiful thing, but many of us don't feel a privilege of knowledge for knowledge's sake. We got into it because the world wasn't good enough. And we at some point said, or felt in our hearts, felt in our bones, that the university might be a really good place to work. One of the things Bill Ayers said was that the university for him, and one way to look at the university as a junior faculty member, is it's kind of your base of operations. That it's where you start, it becomes your home, and then from there you go out and you hope to do great things. One of the tricks of the academy or the open secrets of the academy, remember how many of us talk about teaching, research, service? And they say, teaching, research, service, we get to divide that into thirds, this is gonna be great. And then what happens when you step onto a campus if you happen to be a junior faculty member? Research, teach competently so you don't embarrass us, and service, not so much. All right, And then we have to make choices, because we didn't get into it. Some of us are teachers from, by, in terms of our background. And so someone comes and has the audacity to get up in our faces and say, yeah, you're hired, but if you want to stay here in five years, don't spend so much time trying to be a great teacher. And certainly don't spend so much time trying to serve, or be a servant, or even be a servant leader. And so, for me, the journey of thinking about a continuum of change has been very personal because I've had to figure out how I'm going to make it in the academy. And so the first thing I noticed, and much of my work, by the way, is based upon that of my mentor, uh, Ted Gordon, who is the chair of the new African and African Diaspora Studies Department at the University of Texas at Austin. I've been under him or working with him, first as a graduate student about 20 years ago, um, 
then I kind of went off and did my own thing, and now I've come back to the University of Texas as we're launching this new department. But one of the starting points is this idea of contextual interventions. That you see that things aren't good enough yet, and you want to be a part of them being better, but you have to do it, and you, you, you're trying to engage, but you don't have the space or the possibility or the power yet to fully transform a space. So your work ends up being contextual. You intervene in, a, in, in, in the context, in a moment, to survive the day. So if, for instance, I'm committed to the idea of being a community-engaged scholar, I work to create space for myself to do that work, and that work might look like what we'll call a contextual intervention. And the contextual intervention will be something where I go out and maybe I find a way to take my research or to take my community engaged work and have it really nicely articulate with research so that I'm going to get publications off of or from my community engaged work. That's a contextual intervention. That is to say it's an intervention in the moment. It's a solution that helps me survive the day. But it did nothing to change the structures of power. In fact, it ends up being complicit with or in some ways supportive of the structures of power as they already exist. Is this making sense at all? I'll, I'll give you a really quick teaching example, like a K-12 teaching example, and I'll try to run two examples parallel. So in the K-12 classroom, in many of our schools, an issue is hunger. The teacher does not have the capacity to solve hunger. But the teacher does have to survive the school day, and she does know that her middle schoolers, especially those three boys over there that are 13 years old and 5'11", and they're growing and they're big, and every day at 2 o'clock they're hungry. And this is her fourth year teaching, so she knows that every year at this day, at this time, at 2 p.m., she's going to have hungry kids. And there's health laws that say you can't take food out of the cafeteria. And there's a principal's rule that you can't have food in the classroom. And we haven't built it into the day. Her contextual intervention is that she has a dr desk drawer. And what's in that desk drawer? Some little granola bars, some little treats, some little fruit snacks. And she goes and she says, Lamar, come over here. Johnny, come over here. And she slips him some food. That's a contextual intervention. It did nothing to change the structures of power. It did nothing to ameliorate a big societal problem, but it helped her run an effective classroom at 2 p.m. when her boys are hungry and her girls are hungry. <clears throat> at some point, we can get to the level of structural interventions, where contextual interventions begin to accumulate and we begin to think more systematically. What if, <clears throat> as a faculty member, the contextual intervention for the community-engaged scholar was to begin to think creatively about ways to survive the moment and to move towards tenure, your tenure track, by articulating your service agenda with your research agenda so that you can publish, and that was your contextual intervention. But you start to think about ways to systematize that. You start to think about ways to uh, facilitate this possibility, not just for you, but for other like-minded folks. And you find a chair who's sympathetic and who's willing to start to make, to open the door a little bit wider. You start to think in terms of how a department at the level of their executive committee can start to think about policy changes that will facilitate community-engaged scholarship. Now you're starting to think in terms of structures of power and how you can work with others to begin to tweak the rules, change the practices, change the policies. These are structural interventions. A structural intervention in our parallel track example would be if I, as a teacher, notice hunger, I get with other parents, they are, are uh, fully understanding of the problem and say, I know my son or my daughter is miserable. Right when I pick them up, they're starving. We have to race home, and they're incredibly moody and they're moody because they're hungry, so I'm with you on this problem, what can we do? And we say, oh, well, there's a church across the street. Why don't we start doing spaghetti dinners however many nights a week? Or why don't we talk to the principal about a policy change? By the way, and I'll try to move quickly to keep us on, on schedule, when it comes to contextual interventions, 
there also can be a resistant edge. And I really like the resistant edge. So the contextual intervention can be an intervention where it sort of goes and flows with the rules, but there can also be a humanizing contextual intervention that has a note of resistance. In other words, saying we're not satisfied with any structures of power that allow inequities or allow, for instance, hunger. So a contextual intervention with a resistant edge might be the teacher saying, it's wasteful that we throw out milk cartons at the end of the lunch period if you haven't finished your milk. Put it in your backpack. We're going to drink it later. Now what you've done is broken rules. What you've done is maybe set yourself up for being written up and eventually fired. But what you've also done is humanized a child and allowed them to exist with the notion that their fundamental basic nutritional needs are more important than somebody's stupid rules. And that's an important lesson for children, especially marginalized children who are pushed off the edge. It might even be an important lesson for assistant professors who got in it to change the world, but are told every day to soften off the rough edges. At some point, we need to claim our humanity, claim the vision of what we want to do, and fight for what we want to do. And our contextual interventions might sometimes have a resistant edge. By the way, if you're going to engage any of this stuff, at the end of the day, you better be better than all your colleagues when it comes to how much you publish. You better be better than all your colleagues in terms of how much money you bring in in grants, if that's the metric. You, if you're going to engage this work and engage it in a way that has you persist to where Kevin is or Kevin was until he just moved back to faculty as an associate vice provost, you better be better than the next, right? That's grandma's wisdom, by the way. Contextual interventions, structural interventions, and what do we hope for? What we hope for is structural transformation. How often does structural transformation come about? Not very often. Last I checked, there's still plenty of kids who are hungry. But we're not about, we're always about the win, we're always about working towards something, but it's also the righteousness of the struggle and the righteousness of the, of the fight and always battling to make it better. And maybe we get to the point of structural transformation, but there's righteousness in the journey, and so we stay on that path. But what we want is the end of world hunger, right? To put it in a kind of silly or crass way. What we want are, as a university of Texas, a Portland State, a University of Alabama, where it's porous and where the walls are sort of, sort of come tumbling down in a sense, and there is this nice seamless integration so that those who pay their taxes in this state benefit from it. Those who are working in this state benefit from what this university has to offer. And the back and forth is this nice flow. But we're, I don't know, I haven't been here too long, but at least the University of Texas, I can tell you we ain't there yet. But I persist at the University of Texas because the fight is righteous and because every day I live in, in sort of righteousness, I don't mean to sound so preacherly, but every day you live in this, that means you're not living on the other side of the fence. And at some point it does become an almost Manachian duality where it's like, are you right or are you wrong? And you wake up in the morning and you go to bed at night and you know whether you did right or you did wrong. The beauty of this work is that you can go to bed tired you might go to bed with tears in your pillow, but when you go to bed, you actually rest easy because you know you, you're doing what you need to do. This is all about being purposeful on that journey and setting yourself up in a way to continue on that journey uh, without, without really losing your mind, a way to continue on this journey and with a solid sense of where you're trying to go. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional versus engaged scholarship, but before I do, I want to share yet another little story. The quick background on this story is this. In case you didn't know, or in case you had a sense of it but didn't know how much, this work, this engagement work in post-secondary education is on fire on a global level. This is not just happening here in the South. It's not just happening in America. It is happening on a global level, guaranteed. It's unbelievable what's happening. And guess where it's really happening a lot right now? In the Arab world. 
five or six, eh, four or five years ago, I got a phone call from some friends in Cairo, where I had been a few different times. They said, Kevin, we want you to come out and do a training with faculty and administrators uh, in the Middle East for a week. And I said, no way. <laughs> no way. What, what, well, where will the training be? It's going to be in Beirut, Lebanon. No way. Thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Oh, come on. We saw you do this and that. We think you'd be great. No way. They called me a third time. And I said, OK. I will seriously consider coming, because you called me three times, if you find me a female co-equal presenter for this week who's from the Arab world. They called me back the next day. And um, my friend Amani Alshimi and I did this workshop. So there's this new alliance called the Ma'an Alliance for community engagement in Arab higher education. And there were about 85 people there for a week in Beirut who had gathered together. And Amani and I had worked together to, to plan this week-long training. But I said to her, look, I don't even speak Arabic. I am not a Middle Eastern specialist. You know, I feel really uncomfortable here. I said, first and foremost, before we do anything, I'd like to just find out where people are. And let's just start with a simple thing. Let's just ask them, what is community for you in your context? And we had people from the Gulf states. People don't have a sense. The Arab world, is, there's 22 countries in the Arab world, everywhere from North Africa all the way up through the Gulf. It's an enormous slice of our earth. I said, let's just ask people in their context, what is community? So guess how long that took to answer that question? Two days. That was great from a training point of view. It was fantastic. You know, I just asked a question and I sit back. Two days go by. They finally came to an understanding and a sense within themselves of what is community. Very interesting work. Unbelievably interesting work. We wrote some of this up, presented it for a couple years, uh, a couple years back. Then I started asking them about their own stories, we, uh, uh, Amani and I started asking them about their own stories of engagement. And at one point, at one point in this training, these were faculty. I would say two thirds, perhaps as much as three quarters of the room were in tears when some colleagues from Palestine, from the West Bank, had told their story which I will not retell now, but I will, I will tell the takeaway that really hit me hard as a professional in this field. They talked about how their students were out in the streets protesting. And how they, for them, that was community engagement, to try to make a better life, to try to do some of the things that Kevin is talking about here in terms of structural transformation. And how some of their students had died. And it hit me that day I had to hold on to the side of the table, and it hit me that day that unlike my experience here in America, now I wasn't in the South 40 years ago in the struggles for civil rights. I'm not that old. But it hit me that today, and this was now three or four years ago, it's a harbinger of things to come for the Arab Spring, that for them, in many cases, community engagement can be a life and death situation. And that's simply not my experience here in America with, with service learning, for example. It's just not my experience. And so it really made me begin to think about how kind of important, impactful, powerful this work is. And yet here in an American, North American context, we situate that in the traditions of our hallowed post-secondary uh, institutions, which I love. So this is hard work. And what I'd like to just say is some of you might have seen versions of this before. I, I give most credit of this. Uh, Andy Furco did a lot of this early work. I think Laura Lee has probably worked on some of this. Barb Holland. I've done some work with this. Many of you, I'm sure, have done some work with this here. The point of this slide is this, is that you will all either have heard or will hear about people say, well, you know, this community engaged scholarship, it's not rigorous. I don't know what it is, you know. You, it, it, it seems so fluffy. But if we take a look, you know, 
traditional scholarship breaks new ground in the discipline. We all know what that is. We all know how important that is. We have disciplinary journals that support it. We have chairs and departments that, for, that, that, that value it. We value it ourselves. It is how we progress. It's how we make new knowledge. In an engaged paradigm, we have to break new ground in the discipline and have direct application in a broader and broader public issues. The bar is higher, not lower. The bar is higher. Not only does it have to meet all the bars of traditional scholarship, but it has to meet an additional bar. It has to have applicable value at some level. Same thing with the second thing. It answers significant questions in discipline that have to be relevant to our community or public issues. It's a higher bar. Third one, it's reviewed and validated by qualified peers in the discipline and the community. That's, that's a really scary place. Theor theoretically grounded and practically applicable. And finally, advances disciplinary knowledge and public knowledge. So I've been hearing, as many of you have for many, many years, yeah, but it's not rigorous, it's soft. I don't buy it because I do it. And it's hard. It's really hard work. Last thing I'll say about this, and I'll pass it back to Kevin. Oh, no, not, not quite yet, is, is this. An old paradigm is, is much more linear. In fact, if we want to take it to its kind of end, we oftentimes know the answers to the questions, or we think we know the answers to the questions, or we certainly are going out to look for the answers to the questions that, that we think we already have in our research. And that is so different from an emergent model where rather than going out into the community with our questions in mind and our answers in mind, we work with community members in a much more emergent, much more emergent, a much messier milieu in which the questions emerge over time. It takes longer, it's harder work. And we can ask ourselves, you know, to what extent are our community partners, however we define them, and I'll tell you in Beirut it's harder to define than it is here in Tuscaloosa. Are they involved in question generation, methodology choice, data gathering, data analysis, and dissemination? I'm not here to, to tell you what's the right answer, but I am here to ask myself first and foremost, and you also, how do those process, processes work for you? Who develops a question? Is it you in your office alone with the door closed? Is that a public, is that a public issue itself? And how do we gather the data? How, you know, who helps? Who has a hand in it? How do I, who, who has a hand in the analysis? And finally, who has an a, a hand in the dissemination? These are really important questions. And I'll just end this little piece by saying my own personal experiences Engaged scholarship is a lot harder, a lot harder work. Okay. So we're toward, we're moving now toward the final part of our remarks before we turn it over to you. And what Kevin and I would like to do is share some examples first from Portland State and then from the University of Texas at Austin and then end with a short video clip in which uh, we'll give you a small slice of what this can look like and a little surprise at the end, and then we're gonna turn it over to you. So about maybe another 10 minutes or so. Okay, two pieces I'd like to talk about at Portland State. <clears throat> Institutional transformation and capstones. Now, when Kevin and I were discussing our remarks today, he said, he said Kevin, Portland State is an example of structural transformation, as he described. And I said, well, tell me more about that. But uh, I'm not sure that he's got me, because I'm a little too close, I'm not sure that he's got me completely convinced. But I will say there are two things, two things that we do at Portland State <clears throat> that I'm very proud of and that I think are emblematic of deep kind of change in post-secondary education uh, that, that uh, similar to that which Kevin spoke about. Number one, there is nothing, what I'm going to say right here, that's very sexy, but it's really important, is we, in 1996, and Laura Lee knows this, I think, I, I, I believe we are the very first institution to do this in the country, uh, in this new wave. Uh, we changed our promotion and tenure guidelines. Now, if any, show of hands if you've been working in the last 
five years on changing your institution's promotion tenure guidelines. Yeah. How's is that fun? That's it. <laughs> it's creative work, right? It can be creative work. It's hard work. It is political work, small p. 1996, Portland State University stepped back because we wanted to be an engaged institution before we were even using that language and to kind of honor our motto that our students gave our then president, Judith Romaley, let knowledge serve the city. And our faculty said, well, if you want knowledge to serve the city, then you need to let it show up where it counts in the promotion and tenure guidelines. And so you'd be surprised how many times I get calls from people, we want to come out and visit Portland State University because we want to see how you change your promotion and tenure guidelines because we're trying to do that at the University of Cincinnati and we want to come out, send a whole team to visit you. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, we can save you some money because it, there's nothing here to see. You can go on the website, go to the provost page, you can look. Section 5, we called it then in 1996, the Scholarship of Outreach. That was the language that was used then. And we have examples for artists, which is very different than scientists, or natural scientists, which is again different from social scientists. We have examples. They said, well, yeah, but we want to come out and see how you did it. I said, well, there's, how we did it really doesn't that's how we did it. How you do it is really important to you. Now, if you'd like, we can have a chat about some processes, maybe thinking about who you want around the table, talking about some, some kind of change leadership strategies that might expedite this process. But at the end of the day, it's hard work. So we did it. And I'll just tell a little teeny vignette here. It wasn't pretty, and it hasn't been pretty. And here's part of why it hasn't been pretty. Because for 100 people that were in the room, there are 100 different interpretations of what was said. Also, there are institutional promotion and tenure guidelines, and those sometimes translate directly down to departments and disciplines, and sometimes they don't articulate at all. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem for our junior faculty. And here's another, here's another problem. Some faculty said, well, I've been doing all this service, and I've been letting knowledge serve the city, and I've been working with these community partners, and I got my students involved, and I'm a really effective teacher, and take a look at my reviews, and I've been working with these community partners, and we did all these brochures and these websites, and look at how they've increased their funding, and this and that and the other. And every single thing that that faculty member said was true, was true, except it didn't meet many of the bars of what we would hold as rigorous scholarship. And that faculty member didn't get it, wasn't advised properly, and when they came up for tenure, they were rejected. And so that sent waves through our faculty. Oh, well, it's all rhetoric. It's all rhetoric. So it's hard work, OK? There's number one. Number two, two of two. I'd like to talk a little bit about our capstone program. At Portland State University, what we did in the early 90s is we completely changed the entire undergraduate education program, the general, general ed program. Sorry, the general ed program. I'm not going to go into that whole story. But the essence of it is our, pro, our then provost was a historian of education, and he said, we're good at one thing at a university, and we're good at research. And I'm going to, he pulled together some of, the fac the, some of the best researchers on our faculty then and said, I want to pay you with release time for a year to do research and to prove to me, if you can, to prove to me that the current distribution model that we have for general education works. They went and they did the research, they came back, and they, they said, we can't do it. It basically doesn't work. In fact, the research that's been out now for 20 or 30 years by people like Peter Ewell and many others, many of you in the room for sure, say, you know, this kind of educational distribution model doesn't work very well for students. So then he said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pay you a second year, and you create something that will work using the research that we had at the time in the early 90s. And they then built what's now known as our university studies program which has today, if any of you are familiar with the AACNU's, American Association for College and Universities, uh, high impact practices, there's these 10 high impact practices, about seven of them have to do with engaged learning. Service learning's in there, uh, first year seminars, community-based research. If you don't know about those high impact practices uh, based on really great groundbreaking research by uh, 
by George Koo. I, I encourage you to take a look at those because they really align really well with this work. And they're all based on research. And so one of the things that we have at Portland State at the end of our undergraduate program is a six credit capstone. Every undergraduate has to take it to graduate. So here's a couple of pieces of the capstone. The first time that my predecessor, Amy Driscoll, built one of these, we came out of the box with five of them. And I remember I know her very well, and she said the story, I don't know how we're going to, how are we going to have enough of us to be able to support these five capstones? Each capstone has a maximum, well, it used to be 12, now it's 15 people. They're all interdisciplinary, they're all community based, and they're all theme based. So for example, a capstone could be, well, it could, it could, be, it could be just about anything that has to do with community <clears throat> and is interdisciplinary and theme based. And the idea is, um, Students come together from multiple disciplines. They work together, ideally over two terms, and bring dis different disciplinary points of view, working together as a team to try to address a salient community issue. That was more than almost 20 years ago. <clears throat> Today, that program persists. And last academic year, we had 234 capstones that were offered, 234 almost 4,000 of our largely seniors and some juniors wow. took a community-based capstone. And that is now part of who we are. It is, we've been doing it for almost 20 years. Our, our faculty that teach in the capstone program are some of our best teachers on campus. And in the last five years, we've spread that work internationally. So I am, myself have led capstones to Oaxaca, Mexico, where we take students we work on community health issues and engagement issues there. So those are two examples of how a university can step back and really make, I think, good on this idea of structural transformation. Nice. nice. So another example of this work, and uh, as, as we've been talking, and I've learned more about Portland State from afar, it's, it's been really exciting to hear really how Portland State, and maybe that's one of the advantages of some of the, uh, like the University of Texas is just so hard to move because it's so big. And some of, the, uh, some of our other institutions are so much more nimble and you see these creative things. So I look to Portland State and just looking through and hearing Kev, there's just amazing stuff going on there. For me as a uh, faculty member at the University of Texas at Austin, my first, the contextual intervention, the immediate intervention was, you know, to start to think through from a conceptual standpoint how to bring research and service together. But then there was also the teaching piece, and then there was also the reality that I'm committed to my graduate students emerging as a certain type of scholar. I want them to be rigorous from a methodological standpoint. I want them to be rigorous in terms of their, their, their theoretical grounding but I also uh, desperately want them to be deeply community engaged, like to their core, that this is who they are as emerging scholars. And so the structural intervention that came was the creation of ICUS, which is the Institute for Community, University, and School Partnerships. I was told not to start this, um, strongly encouraged not to start this, but there were also folks in the university who were very supportive. And so it became a, a, a trick of finding mentors and finding empowered mentors and sort of navigating these terrains in order to do a certain type of work. And ICUS becomes a vehicle for the type of work that I hope to do as a scholar. So we train students, we conduct research, we serve communities. These are some of the programs that we had over time. And each one of them has its own backstory. COBRA, and I you know, won't do them all, but COBRA, is the Community of Brothers and Revolutionary Alliance. COBRA was started because uh, I was hanging out in community and there was this thing called an African American Men and Boys Conference that happened once a month. And we came together and we convened and really we did a whole lot of talking at kids. And it was a good thing on, on a certain level, but we all knew it wasn't enough. And I got to know a principal there because we'd see each other month after month after month. And at some point he said, you know what, Kevin, this is great, but here's my problem on my campus. Would you be willing to, to come and do something? 
And so I came and as a volunteer sat in the library and had 12 African American boys and we were working on inter uh, disciplinary referrals and their engagement and this sort of thing. And the long story short is that this became Cobra. And the boys came up with the name. There's a novel by Sam Greenlee called The Spook Who Sat By The Door. If you ever teach it, you have to work on worrying about the misogynistic aspects of it. It's a black power era novel. And so there's, there's problems with the novel, but there's also a lot going on in the novel that's really powerful in terms of having people be self-advocates, having people emerge as intellectuals who are purposeful about change, et cetera. It's a revolutionary text. And the gang that our hero in the novel turned into a revolutionary organization, he turned them away from being a gang and towards being a revolutionary organization, the gang was Cobra. So the school district is funding a revolutionary organization, they just don't know it. <laughs> Voices came into being because after our first year on campus, things went really well and money was a little more flush back then. And so the district came and said, something's happened on, in our data on this campus. This particular cell, African American boys, has just exploded because 12 African American boys makes a difference on a campus. So what do you do? I said, I don't really know. I, you know it, we did whatever we did, and they said, well, that sounds good enough for us. Here's money, which was an interesting lesson, by the way. They didn't understand what we did. We barely understood what we did. But at that moment, it was solving a problem, so here's money. Time to change a little bit, by the way. But everything's cyclical. It'll come back around again. But we were doing good work, so I was happy to take their money. <clears throat> when we expanded, we went to another campus and within a couple of months, the boys group was going great and some girls came to us, some young ladies came to us and they said, this is not fair, this is not right. You've got a boys group, what about us? And I went back to the district and I said, what about them? And the district said, we're not worried about them. They didn't mean to say it that crassly, but they basically did. They had uh, a focus on what was happening with black boys in particular. And so that became their focus and everything else was going to be okay until it became a crisis too. But that wasn't good enough for the young ladies. So we said to the young ladies, well, just come to the meetings. And they came for about three weeks and they said, yeah, no. We want our own. And so we sort of reallocated our resources, we shifted things around, and we created a, a girls group beside the boys group. They named it Voices verbally outspoken individuals creating empowered sisters. <laughs> you can clap. <laughs> they were immediately tighter and better than anything the boys had ever done. <laughs> they were amazing. Um, and then uh, I won't go into uh, the next ones uh, right now. One of the things we do uh, with iCusp right now. How many of you have ever seen TED Talks? Well, we thought about it, and one of my sort of politics, or one of the things I'm interested in, is more and more scholarships getting on, more and more scholars getting on this bandwagon. More and more scholars waking up to the possibilities of community-engaged scholars, scholarship. Now, faculty members have very small egos, <laughs> right? Okay, so faculty members have huge egos. And I've discovered that if I can talk to scholars, other faculty members, about how their work can be disseminated more broadly, how more people could learn the brilliant things that they have to say, they're often on board. But it comes with a catch. You're gonna have to go through our training. Because what we do, we partner with KLRU Public Television this, on the set of, how many of you have ever seen Austin City Limits? So we, we record on the set of, all, of the, the historic set of Austin City Limits, we record uh, twice a year five black studies faculty members giving basically the TED talk to black studies. And we're calling it black academics right now, but we're fighting over the name. We'll probably lose the name. So if anyone has a cool name to replace <laughs> ours, that, that would be great. But what we do is take time to train them in principles of adult learning, we train them in terms of principles associated with new media presentations, <coughs> being in front of a camera, et cetera. And then we take them, they all do 12 minute talks, we edit them down, they air as television shows. So every two talks becomes a TV show, and every talk is released online on an almost monthly basis. 
So that's one different form of uh, community engagement that's taking advantage of new media. My staff are all graduate students. This is one of the COBRA chapters. All of these boys are in college, every one of them. COBRA begat Young COBRA, which is our middle school version. This, is, this slide uh, is of some of our kids presenting a, uh, and talking about a video that they made. So these are sixth graders talking before 300 of their peers from across the city. One of the chapters, we brought in the author, Sam Greenlee, uh, the author of Spook Who Sat By The Door. This is just one of our chapters. These are the kids using technology on the University of Texas campus. By the way, if you teach anything with public education or many of the courses, if any of you are faculty members that you might teach, when you have partnerships, one of the things that's really cool is the opportunity for kids who live in the surrounding area to begin to see the possibilities. When I teach a course on public education and I invite high school kids to come in, I'll prep the kids and talk to them about the reality that they know more about high school than the college students. And that when it comes down to it, they're the experts in the room. So they should not be hesitant to raise their hands and to say something if I get it wrong or someone else gets it wrong. And we're beginning to invite them into the idea of college as a possibility. They're familiar with this technology because they're working with it when we bring them to campus. COBRA teaching young COBRA, intergenerational work. So this is a workshop on what it's going to be like in high school. By the way, every different color is a different <coughs> chapter. So the kids have their school colors on. We don't do t-shirts, we do polo shirts with the nice lettering and the embroidered lettering. And there's a sense of um, empowerment, a sense that they're a part of something special when they're involved in these. <coughs> This is, uh, what, two years ago. These are just uh, some of the kids in COBRA. Um, I don't have any money, but I go to church. So when we go somewhere, I have folks at this particular church, and they have six vans, because it's one of those big churches, and they are awesome about Oh, yeah, Dr. Foster, yeah, you, you can do this. Yeah, we'll, we'll help you out with this and that and the other. Vans becomes not as much of a problem. <laughs> We have to work on the legal side, by the way. There's, there's a, there, we, we, do, we do due diligence um, when it comes to those, that aspect of it. But we have partners. Um, here's a free trade coffee house. They love to have kids in. They're not charging us money to do it. They're giving kids samples of this and that. They're walking the kids through. It's very global in perspective when they're seeing this stuff. Um, I'm not an elected official, but I have a lot of kids. And all my kids have parents, and my parents vote. So if I call Congressman Doggett and I say I got 300 kids, and the 300 kids have parents, da, 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 guess what? Kev, would you like, you know, yes, I'll sit down with you and we'll record a video congratulating the kids on their work. Same with Councilman uh, Cole, Councilman Spellman. I've got an award ceremony. Are you willing to come and record a special note? Absolutely. Support from campus leaders. And by the way, I have two kids. And for this to work, because this work is hard and this work is like a 90 hour work week or whatever it is at the end of the day, but it's an easy, not easy to do 90 hour work week. It's a fun 90 hour work week if I integrate it with the rest of my life. And everyone has to make their own decisions about this. I integrate it with my life. My kids know the Cobra kids and the Voices kids, because my kids are on the field trips. So that's my son Malcolm, that's my daughter Marley. They come with us, they're engaged. And by the way, an unearned privilege that my kids have is that there's no question about their leadership ability, their leadership <clears throat> skills. There's no question that they're gonna go to college. There's no question that what was once about being a first generation person, it's not gonna be a problem being a second generation, third generation, fourth generation, because they are integrated into the life of the work. Whether they love dad or hate dad, they know what dad's about. <laughs> this is my staff, or this, this is another staff picture. Does it look like we have fun, by the way? We have lots of fun. In fact, yeah, we have lots of fun. This is staff. Um, 
now a University of Illinois professor, now a University of uh, North Texas professor, now uh, working in a university outreach center, um, local arts activist, still graduate student, and two more that are still graduate students. My kids actually, oh, I shouldn't, oh, I'm sorry, my graduate students actually get jobs. And what I've found over and over again when folks call us is that one of the things that at UT, we've got lots of, you know, we've got the research dollars, we've got the courses, we've got the coursework. Folks don't get hired because they fail the interview. And folks don't get hired because there's so many amazing people out there. It turns out that community engagement is something that many folks, like Kev was saying, are interested in. And when any of my students begin to tell their story and begin to show the purpose of their work, the pride in their work, the power of their work, and how their scholarship is integrated with a profound ability to engage community in powerful ways, we find their landing jobs. So where we were today, as a, 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 a summary, well, we'll just keep this up and go from there, and I'll turn it back over. So we want to make sure that we end this with a strong sense of hope. So for those of you who have been in this field for as long as I have, you'll laugh at this. But you know, 25 years ago, the most important thing that we debated, and I can go back and show you the archives on the Higher Ed Service Learning Listserv. The most important thing we debated, according to us at that time, was whether the term service learning should carry a hyphen or not. <laughs> OK? That's where we were, and that's fine. Today, we have graduate student networks. We have multiple international associations that support this work, just like NOSC. We have uh, numerous publication outlets. We have graduate students like yourselves and undergraduates who are hungry for this work. New young faculty are coming in expecting it, and students that are expecting it. What a difference a quarter of a century makes. So where we want to end this piece is with a short video. It's about three or four minutes. This isn't the best video. Um, it's not necessarily the best work. But in this video, you'll see um, a man who's uh, on the faculty at Portland State, who's a, uh, an architect, who's very community engaged. And I just encourage you to watch for things like how he teaches, who's there, what they're doing, um, if you can see some research around it, and just kind of enjoy a little snippet of what in this particular case, community-based learning or service learning can look like. And I'll just say that one of the things that was very important to, to, um, uh, to Sergio was because his two kids, before he moved to Portland, had to go to school in temporary classrooms and trailers. And he hated it because he knows all the research shows that if you have natural light, good ventilation, uh, and some other kind of simple uh, adjustments, the kids learn a lot better. And it's been a real... Uh, real fight for him. And at, at the end of the story, I'll tell you uh, what's happened since. So if you could, hopefully the video will work, and it'll be easy. This is on our website, by the way, if you want to see it again. More than anywhere else that I have lived, people believe in the makeability of place. People here do not believe that they're just subject to anonymous forces that they can't control. People here believe that they can really influence their environment. And I think we teach our students to be part of that by giving them a real opportunity through our capstone projects and all of our other uh, joint research that we do with organizations throughout the city. At Sunnyside, which is one of our client schools, one of the schools that has agreed to engage in this kind of crazy dialogue with my students. We are several classes at PSU, but the capstone is kind of like the funnel that's bringing all this together, is trying to figure out what the school of the future would be here. We want to look at schools in terms of how they perform as buildings and whether they're using too much energy, whether they're um, using solar energy, whether they're taking care of um, keeping out the sun on the sides of the building that gets too much sun, all, all those kind of things that go into thinking about sustainability as a building performance. To start the design, you really want to um, come and talk to the people that you're going to be designing for. So we came out to Sunnyside Elementary School a number of times, talked with the kids, we came and talked with the parents. 
um, interviewed the kids about what they like. We had them draw designs of maybe what they would want their classrooms to look like. They had like giant slides running through them. This class is about uh, social architecture, which is like basically coming coming back to what how people actually use the space in the community and and how architecture and the built environment starts to play a role in, in how people live their lives and getting back to the root of the user. You can read about you know educational gardens all you want, but then when you come out and you start planting with kids, it's it's just a whole different experience. Uh, last year we did, we connected the rain barrels in hopes that we could take some of the water from the roof and help to water some of the the school's garden spaces and, and plants. You can see there planting a lot of stuff around here. So today I'm coming back and disconnecting the barrels so that the Sunnyside school kids can decorate it with paint. So what are you making? A flower. A flower? Are you cutting it out? Yeah. Okay, and then you're going to help us put it on the barrels? Yeah. Okay. The kids are drawing different um, things. So this one is a dragonfly, as you can see here. So the kids draw it. And then we're cutting them out and making stencils and putting them on the rain barrels. So that they're not just huge blue plastic barrels, but that there could be some, you know, some of the kids' artwork. And it's hard for them to kind of have their imprint on the space, and so this lets them do that. Sustainable schools make kids perform a lot better. Natural light makes kids perform better. Um, and so sustainable architecture is about creating a healthy relationship between the earth, the occupants of the buildings, and the resources we invest in these buildings. So this is one of our proposals for a design for an outdoor classroom at here at Sunnyside Elementary School. Um, the whole um, proposal behind it is they have a, a large water problem here. They're, they get a big puddle in the middle of the playground when it rains hard. So we wanted to um, harvest that water and make a bioswale to, um, for the children to learn to garden and, and to capture that water. And then our building is a modular system built of recycled 2x4s. So you could go to the rebuilding center or anywhere that you can find old 2x4s and an individual family could put together one of these modules and everybody comes together and it can create whatever shape you want. Well, we for sure could not do this without their help. For one thing, they have brilliant ideas that we would maybe not even ever have. Like they just think of things differently. Um, they're able to look at space and um, think about what will work with different materials and just different ideas and design and they've worked a lot with our community to get input but they then put it onto paper and today they're actually helping us um, have it come true. Personally I, I like these types of projects because there's a kind of a, a realness to it you know in a lot of the other studios we are designing things that are just purely kind of theoretical and things that will definitely never never be built and maybe never never even benefit anybody. Portland State should be doing way more of these projects. I mean, if you're going to live in the city and live with these people, why not use the education that you're getting now to to, to start early? Why wait until like you get a job <laughs> to help out the people that you live with? I'll say one more thing, I'll pass it to you for the So the epilogue to this video, which was made a couple years ago, is now Sergio, who you can tell, the, the main professor, is so passionate about the role of architecture in making and creating better learning environments for these kids, is that he has successfully lobbied the Oregon legislature. And now his work has made a permanent, hopefully permanent, public policy change. And that all modular classrooms, AKA trailers, in Oregon, will now have to meet certain specs that he has designed. And they've approved that and in terms of natural light, ventilation, basic things. They're actually very cost efficient. And so I, for me, that's a way of showing how, again, how the structural transformation, how one faculty member's vision and work in combination with the whole community can really make permanent, durable change. So back to Kev for the end here. So. Um Given what we said at the very beginning, or at least what I said at the very beginning, how did we let you down this morning? What's that? What did I promise that I didn't deliver, that we didn't deliver on? Time. Time for discussion, right? So, Dr. Pleasance is a brilliant person, and we have a post-conference dialogue at 2.30. Let's see, a post, 
We're going to talk. And hopefully you all will talk. So 2.30 in RAST B, for any folks who want to continue the conversation, continue the dialogue, I think we'll try to, you know, Kevin and I will sort of get together and think about how to be better at decentering ourselves. I mean, what you've found is two folks who like to talk, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> so, um, but we do, we do think, or at least I hope, that this was information packed. Was there good information this morning? Okay. <laughs> And one of the things we both know, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, um, is that we have ideas that we've developed over the years. And when we're, we're excited about them, we're passionate about them, but we also are keenly aware of what is in the room in terms of the work that you all are doing. So we really do want to continue a dialogue and do a, probably a better job this afternoon at, at sort of opening it up. Um, Kev's work, uh, if you go to the Hatfield School of Government faculty page, the first um, link is to Kev's work. And you'll, you know, you'll get his Vita and all that other stuff in his bio, but you'll also see links to his articles. Uh, for me, you can go to academia.edu. How many use academia.edu? Very few. It's an awesome repository. It's an awesome place, kind of like Facebook in a sense, but for, for nerds. And you can start your page, and there's a space to upload documents. So all of my documents, and I have to fight with publishers, all of my documents, all of my articles are available there as, as a PDF. Um, for me, follow me on Twitter, and I'll you know, follow you back. And also my blog, and there's a, also the ICUSP Facebook page. If you go to the Portland State page, there, it's a dynamic page, so you'll see examples of the videos and examples of the work that they're doing as well there. Um, we probably should wrap up at, at this point. Um, thank you to the conference hosts and the conference planners. I've really, this has been an excuse for me to get to know a new friend and colleague. So I really like this setup. I hope it worked for you all. Thank you all for this time and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>